Hey everyone, Chris here. Thanks for checking out the podcast. If you're enjoying it and learning something along with us, please consider becoming a supporting patron at patreon.com slash a teacher of history. Or you could leave a rating and review on iTunes. It would be a huge help. If you'd like to raise your hand and participate along with us, you can find us on Facebook, Twitter, at a teacher fifth, or shoot me an email, chris at a teacher history.com. All right, let's get on to the next episode. Hello, and welcome to A Teacher of History of the United States. Thanks so much for joining me again today. Did you know that one of the major issues that caused the War of 1812, British impressment of American sailors, was actually happening in the 1790s also? And the, the treaty that tried to put a stop to this, Jay's Treaty, only further infuriated the Republicans and Thomas Jefferson specifically, helping to spur him into action to run for president in 1796. And that once again, it was Alexander Hamilton who was the mastermind behind so much of it. Did you know all of this? Maybe, maybe not. Get your notebooks out because today we will cover that and more in episode 84, Jay's Treaty and Pinckney's Treaty. All right, everyone, welcome in to episode 84. No book recommendations for today. One thing I do want to note is there will be a bonus episode up on the Patreon page, um, really, hopefully, as you're listening to this, with some uh, fun and interesting facts about George Washington. I will also be putting up a biography of uh, George Washington next week also up on the Patreon page. So check them out when you have a chance. Last week, we covered the first couple years of Washington's second term. We briefly touched on the proclamation of neutrality issued by Washington that ended up being the final straw, seemingly, for Thomas Jefferson. We covered the uncomfortable situation with citizen Edmund Genet and discussed the causes and effects of the Whiskey Rebellion. Today, we will continue discussing Washington's second term, only our focus will primarily be on foreign policy. And, of course, the impact these foreign policy decisions had on America both at home and abroad. The first event we will be discussing is the Jay Treaty, or Jay's Treaty, as it's sometimes referenced. If the National Bank and the Assumption Bill were the most notable constitutional crises of Washington's first term, the Jay Treaty and the subsequent reaction was the constitutional crisis that best defines his second term. And it is important to note just how much this impacted Washington's reputation, because while he handed over the reins of the financial plan completely to Alexander Hamilton, this issue, Jay's treaty, was one that Washington was involved with from the very beginning, and the public began to take their anger out on him personally, forever damaging his reputation in the eyes of some. The outbreak of the war in 1793 between France and Great Britain caused consternation for Washington and his cabinet alike, while also dividing the American public. Fortunately for the United States, though, this conflict and our subsequent proclamation of neutrality allowed the U.S. to emerge as a real player in international politics. As mentioned last episode, one of the strategic goals for Edmund Genet was to ensure that the American shipping lanes to France would continue to stay open, and that the French could count on American goods. Great Britain was fully aware of the affinity that the American public had toward the French, and considering the open wounds that still existed between the U.S. and Great Britain, the British were determined to do what they could do to begin to repair this relationship. From America's perspective, Stabilizing trade with Great Britain sounded like a great idea. On top of that, there were also some issues left over from the Revolutionary War, specifically the presence of British troops in the West, that needed to be dealt with. But based on British actions, 
They were far more worried about the U.S. assisting the French than they were in stabilizing relationships between the U.S. and Great Britain. The British were frustrated that the French had used some of the final debt payments from the United States to buy supplies for the war against Britain. The British were so frustrated by the Americans at this time that they informed George Washington in the end of 1793 that they knew they were maintaining post in the Northwest in violation of the Treaty of Paris and intended to do so, quote, indefinitely, knowing it would give them future negotiating leverage with the Americans. During the winter of 1793 and 1794, Britain began to capture American merchant ships, over 250 of them, that were carrying goods from the French West Indies. In The Growth of the American Republic, its authors contend that, quote, If a main schooner laden with lumber and salt fish ventured into the harbor of St. George's, Bermuda, she would be boarded by a gang of ruffians, Stripped of her rudder and sails, her seamen consigned to the calaboose or impressed into the Royal Navy, and the vessel libeled in His Majesty's Court of Vice Admiralty. The burden of proof that the cargo was not somehow stained by French association was placed upon the Yankee skipper. Condemnation was certain. And look, this was a big deal. Blinded with rage over the capture of these American ships, Thomas Jefferson demanded that the U.S. do something about this, arguing that, quote, If particular nations grasp at undue shares of ocean commerce, and more especially, if they seize on the means of the United States to convert them into their own ailment for their own strength, and withdraw them entirely from the support of those to whom they belong, Defensive and protecting measures become necessary on the report of the nation whose marine resources are thus invaded. Jefferson deep down wanted to declare war on Britain, but his official stance, likely aided by the convincing arguments of James Madison, was that America should propose an embargo on Britain, hoping to hit them where it hurt the most, their pocketbook. With his opinions well known, Jefferson packed up his things to leave his post as Secretary of State and handed over responsibility for carrying on his political platform to his buddy, James Madison. Madison officially submitted the proposal on commercial restrictions to Congress, and it was passed. Hamilton hated this idea. He didn't think America had the leverage it needed to pull off a stunt like this, and pretty predictably, George Washington agreed with him. They saw this for what it was. It was more than a proposal on commercial trade restrictions. In their mind, it was an arrangement that threatened American neutrality by and large, and by effect, threatened war. But the Republicans felt justified. Not only did Britain control much of the American trade, but they had openly and flagrantly decided to stay in their post in the Northwest. They were harassing American neutral merchant ships and They even had Lord Dorchester, the Governor General of Canada, speaking inflammatory language toward the Western Indians about the Americans in February of 1794. This was a speech that many Republicans considered to be a declaration of war with the U.S. The Federalists had to do something, and they knew it. Seeing as how most Federalists were in New England and needed to protect American trade at all cost, something a war with Britain would destroy, they figured the best bet was to try to work out a peaceful resolution between the countries. In order to prevent this powder keg from blowing up, Washington knew he needed to act quickly. In April of 1784, George Washington ended up sending John Jay, the Supreme Court Chief Justice, to London to negotiate. His instructions were to figure out a way to get these British troops out of the Northwest Territory and come up with an amenable trade relationship that would maintain the peace between Britain and America. On top of these two priorities, American merchant ships also wanted open trade in the Caribbean. American citizens wanted the border between the U.S. and Canada to be clarified, and Westerners wanted the British to stop providing natives with firearms and inflammatory language. Basically, if there was unfinished business, Washington wanted it finished. 
He knew that America would never be able to survive in its current state if it were to go to war with Britain again, at least not anytime soon, and they needed to do something to remove this dark cloud that was hanging over the relationship between them. And you have to understand, to many Republicans, any type of negotiation with Britain was unacceptable. So just going to London, in their mind, was already a mistake. On top of this, and something that really hit home in Virginia, was the topic of these debts. See, Britain had many troops in the Northwest as sort of a symbolic response to the fact that a lot of British creditors who had built relationships prior to the revolution had not been paid off yet. Who were the men who had borrowed money from them? Well, a lot of them were planters from Virginia. And to Virginia's horror, John Jay, a guy that actually supported the repayment of these loans, was sent to negotiate on America's and, in effect, their behalf. In the minds of many of these Virginia merchants and planters and politicians, George Washington, their fellow Virginian, could not have chosen a worse person to lead the negotiations. So as you can probably assume, John Jay lost the public relations battle before he even landed in Britain. And while history at times has not been too kind to one Mr. Jay, Washington's choice in retrospect was a wise one. In his biography of John Jay, George Pellew, wrote that, quote, peace could be secured only by immediate negotiation and at least a temporary settlement of the causes of mutual irritation. And for such a task, the ministers at London and Washington were incompetent or unsuited. Mr. Pinckney, the American minister at London, was, according to John Adams, a man of prejudices and strongly pro-Gallican, while Hammond, the English minister at Washington, had little prudence or moderation. But while Pellew is adamant that John Jay was the right choice, Washington at first wasn't sure who to pick. Jefferson was gone, and his replacement, Edmund Randolph, wasn't particularly highly regarded enough yet. I mean, the guy had never even been to England or France. Who was highly regarded enough? Well, in the minds of some, Alexander Hamilton, of course. But while Hamilton was having a huge impact on foreign policy, he recognized that choosing him would only make things worse back home, writing to Washington that he was withdrawing his name from consideration and instead recommending John Jay. Hamilton wrote, quote, Of the persons whom you would deem free from any constitutional objections, Mr. Jay is the only man in whose qualification for success there would be thorough confidence. In him alone, it would be advisable to send. While Jay did not have the fondest recollection of the French or of their government from his previous trip there to negotiate the Treaty of Paris, his resume was a great one. Jay drove a hard bargain with the English a decade prior, and since then he only furthered his personal reputation with his admirable service on the Supreme Court a role that Washington recommended he relinquish when accepting this new job, a recommendation that Jay politely ignored. But his personal presence mattered little to the Francophile Republicans. They were infuriated with the choice of John Jay. They knew he was fiercely independent, and outside of Hamilton, he was the worst possible choice. As Foreign Secretary, under the Articles of Confederation, Jay had gone rogue in attempting to negotiate a treaty with Spain that was wildly unpopular and clearly was a betrayal of Western interest over Eastern commerce. With this in mind, James Monroe, the minister to Paris in 1794, wrote that the choice of John Jay was so bad that it was almost as bad as choosing, gasp, Alexander Hamilton. To make matters worse, John Jay was an outspoken critic of Ed Edmund Genet and was actually sympathetic to the British intention of retaining control of the forts in the Northwest. Yes, you heard that correctly. In Jay's treaty, A Study of Commerce and Diplomacy, historian Samuel Flagg Bemis wrote that, quote, from the facts of Jay saw them, he declared Great Britain wholly justified in retaining the post. He believed honestly that she could not be blamed for holding them while the United States 
on its side impeded full execution of the treaty. And this was actually a really important thing to point out because John Jay was a legalist at heart. I mean, he truly believed in the letter of the law. That's actually what made him such a great negotiator at the Treaty of Paris in 1783 because he was able to just obsessively stick to the objective facts. Well, this does not play in his favor when he heads over to England to negotiate this treaty because the facts were the Americans, at least some of them, had not paid off their debt from prior to the war. This made Jay actually sort of sympathetic to the British argument, which, as you can imagine, many Republicans did not like. And here's the thing. It was one thing to hold that opinion privately, but Jay actually shared it with a British diplomat. Quote, the imparting of such confidential information by a man in Jay's office must have considerable significance in explaining the delay of Great Britain in evacuating the post, Bemis continued. But setting these public concerns aside, Hamilton still wanted to move forward with the choice of John Jay, convincing him to serve in a role he knew would likely be an unpleasant one. But Jay accepted, receiving instructions officially from Edmund Randolph and unofficially from Alexander Hamilton, John Jay prepared to travel to England with an incredible amount of freedom, independence, and discretion during these negotiations. But before he left, Hamilton cut his legs out from under him. Speaking with a British diplomat in America, Hamilton pretty shockingly detailed the purpose of Jay's trip and even mentioned the ideal outcomes for the United States and John Jay. Historian L.B. Kupheimer remarked that, quote, not only was Jay not made aware of this exchange, but he also had to face the unfortunate timing of arriving for talks when the British were enjoying a series of military triumphs on the continent. Against such a background, it would have been difficult for anyone, including Hamilton himself, to have negotiated anything like favorable terms. What made things worse for Jay? Well, the actual terms of the treaty, because in the minds of some, it was incredibly favorable to Britain and very unpopular, even though, objectively, it did have both good and bad. So, the good. Britain agreed to remove their troops from the frontier, even though they never did this, which was one of the primary causes of the War of 1812. Britain also agreed to address complaints that their navy had confiscated private property. Britain then agreed to consider compensation for these acts. The not-so-good, or the bad. The language in the treaty made it seem like America was admittedly inferior to Britain, especially when it came to the economy and presence of the navy. Britain gave America, quote, favored nation status with regards to trade. And America agreed to return the favor, which seemed like a much bigger concession for America than it was for Britain. Jay was not able to secure open trade for merchants in the West Indies. And Jay, who was anti-slavery, didn't make much of an attempt to get compensation for the southern slaves who had been taken to the West Indies by loyalists following the war. And to make matters worse... He wasn't able to make much headway on the issue of the British capturing American soldiers – or sailors, excuse me – and forcing them into the British Navy, an action that we will refer to as impressment moving forward. This is also, like I mentioned in the tease at the beginning of the episode, a major cause for the War of 1812. This treaty was so bad, at least to some, that Republican critics were furious – Jefferson remarked that it made America look like a British colony all over again. It was supposed to keep peace between the nations, which would be extremely beneficial to America as a profitable trade relationship with Britain was essential to the burgeoning nation. But optically, it just looked so weak and pathetic. When the terms were leaked, the Republicans lost their minds. John Jay recognized that he had just become public enemy number one in the minds of a large group of Americans. 
John Jay recalled that Washington's residents was, quote, surrounded by innumerable multitudes from day to day, buzzing, demanding war against England, cursing Washington, and crying success to the French patriots and virtuous Republicans. When Washington heard of the terms, though, he was much more satisfied than most. Once again, Washington reminded himself that whether he liked it or not, America was in no position to go to war with Britain, and the most important thing at this time was to keep peace while America could build itself up into a more formidable enemy. And his inclination was correct. Henry Adams, the great-grandson of John Adams, later remarked that the, quote, Jay Treaty was a bad one. Few persons then ventured to dispute. No one would venture on its merits to defend it now. And while Adams may have been overstating just how unpopular it was at the time, he was correct in just how well it had aged. In June of 1795, Washington submitted the treaty to the Senate for their approval. As expected, the treaty was initially unpopular, and the two-third vote required in the Senate to pass it seemed like a bit of a long shot. And what made things worse for Washington back home was that it provided another issue for the Republican opposition to grab a hold of and help propel them into the national political debate once again. Because while the treaty may have seemed to be a pretty reasonable compromise between these two nations, the biggest problem is that it did not compromise the desires of the divided American public. This treaty just seemed to be so one-sided, and Democratic Republicans could not get past the fact that it seemed to be a Federalist-endorsed agreement that they were forced to be on board with, against their will and what they believed to be the best interest of the nation. Honestly, they couldn't wrap their mind around how this treaty could have possibly happened. In their mind, it was an agreement between Britain and the New England Anglophiles that directly hurt most representatives in the House and their constituents. I mean, how could this be okay? In their minds, Britain was the epicenter of aristocracy and monarchical corruption. They argued that Jay and Hamilton— because Hamilton is lumped in with pretty much everything, had turned their backs on the Republican values of the revolution in agreeing to this treaty with Britain. But what were they going to do about it? Well, they weren't going to go down without a fight. The Jeffersonian Republicans took the debate to the public stage, continuing to denounce the motives of their fellow Americans in the Federalist camp. They reminded the people of the British support of the natives in the North and in the West, and that Jay likely didn't make much of an attempt at all to receive compensation for the lost slaves in the South. In town, cities, and state capitals all throughout the South, organized opposition to the Jay Treaty reached an intensity that had not been seen since the beginnings of the revolutionary movement. Once again, though, the Federalists were just as organized, if not more. And they still had the ace up their sleeve. They had George Washington and all of the prestige that came with him and everything he stood for. The approach was effective, and the Senate approved the treaty by a 20 to 10 vote in June. Point Hamilton. And on a side note, I can only imagine how incredibly frustrated Jefferson and Madison must have felt at this point, constantly being outmaneuvered and outpoliticked time and time again by Alexander Hamilton. Then again, it helps when you have the ear of the most influential and powerful man in the country, like Hamilton did, and President Washington. But the looming question remained. Should Washington sign this treaty? I mean, the treaty was nothing without Washington's signature. With a divided cabinet and a furious electorate, Washington had a lot to consider. It was a tough decision for sure, even though in retrospect we know that the treaty was incredibly beneficial to America in the long run. But while he was probably going to sign it in the end anyways, there was a specific impetus that pushed him to make the final decision. Edmund Randolph, who I mentioned earlier had become the new Secretary of State following Jefferson, had had some private conversations with the French minister. Washington was provided with the details of these conversations in August of 1795, and he was furious. Randolph, based on the intelligence Washington received, 
seem to imply that Washington was fumbling around, falling prey to the whims of the New England-loving Federalist in his cabinet. He also seemed to give himself credit for being the only person in the cabinet able to prevent a total collapse in legitimacy. Following this news, Washington demanded Randolph resign, which he did. And Washington then signed the treaty and submitted it to the Senate in August of 1795. But Madison wasn't done yet. He wrote the Constitution, so if anyone could try to find a loophole in it to exploit, it was going to be him. Madison argued that the House of Representatives had the power of the purse, and that if they wanted to weaken the treaty, they could just refuse to provide the funds that was needed. Not only that, but this treaty technically regulated commerce, which was a power of commerce. Thus, the House, along with the Senate, needed to approve it. With these arguments in hand, the debate raged in the House of Representatives. The Republicans in the House demanded to see the details of the treaty, and some even argued that the House had veto power over such an agreement. But all of this effort was to no avail if the treaty eventually passed by three votes in April 1796. Jefferson, incredibly disappointed, understood how this had happened. Washington was still too powerful and influential to lose such an important debate. Jefferson explained to Madison that Washington was, quote, the man who outweighs them all in influence over all the people. With the controversy of the treaty behind him, George Washington reflected on the nature of how it played out. The political maneuvering behind the scenes disgusted him and confirmed more than ever that retirement was necessary. Washington wrote to Jay that, quote, indeed the trouble and perplexities with which they occasion have added to the weight of years which have passed over me and have worn away my mind more than my body and renders ease and retirement indisputably necessary to both during the short time I have to stay here. In the end, John Jay probably gets unfair treatment when we talk about this treaty. I have a stack of about 10 different AP U.S. history textbooks, and for the most part, this treaty is portrayed as a failure, a treaty that was not the best interest of the United States. But look, I don't think that's fair. This treaty was, yeah, maybe symbolically a failure, maybe at the time optically a failure, but practically, many historians contend that this treaty ushered in 15 more years of peace between the United States and Britain opened up commercial intercourse, and brought the U.S. and Britain closer together, helping to heal the wounds of the Revolutionary War, which in the long run seemed to work out well, considering America's eventual rise to power in the Western world with England and its most trusted ally. But don't worry, I'm not totally ignoring the little war that the two countries fought in between 1812 and 1815. But there will always be detractors, no one will ever know for sure how the negotiations played out and whether or not someone else could have received more concessions from the British. In the end, it is all speculation. And I think it's best for us just to determine on our own what we think about it because that's what's most important. Oh, and on a seemingly unrelated side note, uh, if you do watch the HBO miniseries John Adams, which I seem to mention pretty much every episode, they portray him as being the tie-breaking vote in the Senate on this treaty. And since it passed by a 20-10 to 10 vote, we know that that is not the case. I love that miniseries, but am sorely disappointed by this unnecessary inclusion of a scene that just isn't even remotely accurate. Strangely, though, when my wife and I watched it together, she didn't really seem as upset about the creative license as I was. With Jay's treaty signed and approved, the relationships with Great Britain moving in the right direction, let's take a look, very briefly, at America's diplomatic efforts toward the other European power with presence in the United States. Spain. The treaty that finalized the border disputes with Spain, at least temporarily, is Pinckney's Treaty also known as the Treaty of San Lorenzo. And I think to best understand the context around this treaty, it's important that I take a moment to remind you of the results of the French and Indian War, because that was about 50 episodes ago, as crazy as that sounds. 
Suffice it to say that following the French and Indian War, Britain had control of present-day Florida and a lot of land north of Florida that was east of the Mississippi. Areas today that are the Florida Panhandle and parts of Georgia, Alabama, and Mississippi. Following the Revolutionary War, you know, the war that didn't turn out so well for Britain, Britain ceded this territory, East and West Florida, back to Spain. But unfortunately for everyone involved, the specific border of West Florida wasn't, well, very specific. When Britain ceded this land back to Spain, there was disagreement between the U.S. and Spain on where the border truly lay. The U.S., of course, argued that the land Britain ceded to Spain was smaller than Spain believed it to be. In 1784, Spain threw their weight around a little bit and closed the port of New Orleans to American shipping. And if you're familiar with American geography, this was a huge deal. The port of New Orleans opens up the Mississippi River into the Gulf of Mexico. If New Orleans was off limits, there was almost no way to get some of these goods from the Gulf up the river. Thomas Pinckney, who was serving as the U.S. minister to Britain at the time, was chosen to negotiate a settlement with Spain. The treaty, agreed to in August of 1795 and ratified by both governments the following year, was a favorable one for the United States. Spain more or less ceded the bottom half of present-day Alabama and Mississippi, extending American land claims hundreds of miles further south toward the Gulf. I'll post a map up on Facebook and Twitter for reference. With the loss of this land, white American settlers began to flow into the region, upsetting the relationship that the natives had had with Spanish control. This, over time, some historians argue, further emboldened desires for manifest destiny in America's expansion west. Making this treaty even more curious was that during 1800, just four years after the ratification of the treaty, Spain, in the secret Third Treaty of San Ildefonso, retroceded to France all of the territory west of the Mississippi and the port of New Orleans. But most had no idea considering Spain still administered control over the territory. This is important because just a couple years later and in a handful of episodes, we will cover the fact that the United States worked out an incredible deal with France to buy this vast piece of land for pennies on the dollar, otherwise known as the Louisiana Purchase. Next week, Bill will be on the pod as we say goodbye to the first and arguably best American president. George Washington. We'll discuss his last months in office and his farewell address. Thanks for listening, and hopefully now you can take pride in knowing just a little bit more about the history of the United States. Class dismissed. <laughs>